Yeah, we have no inside information about great new uses for silver or anything of the sort, but the, the situation, and you can, you can get these figures, and they're not precise, but I think they're in general, uh, they're, they're generally accurate. You can, you can see from looking at the numbers that uh, aggregate demand, primarily from photography, from industrial uses, and from ornamental jewelry type uses, uh, is close, uh, call it 800 million plus ounces a year. And there are 500 million or so ounces being produced of silver annually, uh, although there will be more coming on in the next couple of years. There's more coming on right now. Uh, however, most of that silver is produced as a byproduct in the mining of gold or copper or lead zinc, so that since it's a byproduct, it's not responsive to not very responsive to price changes because obviously if you've got a copper mine and you get a little silver out of it, you're much more interested in the price of copper than silver. So you have 500 million ounces or so of mine production and you have 150 million ounces or so of uh, reclaimed silver, a large part of which relates to, to the uses in photography. Uh, so there's been a gap in recent years of um, perhaps 150 million ounces, but none of these figures are precise which has been filled by an inventory of bullion above ground, which may have been a billion two or more ounces a few years back, but which has been depleted. And no one knows the exact figures on this, but there's no question that the bullion inventory has been depleted significantly, which means that the present price for silver does not produce an equilibrium between supply as measured by newly mined silver plus reclaimed silver and, and usage. And that eventually uh, something will happen to change that picture. Now it could be reduced usage, it could be increased supply, or it could be a change in price. And that imbalance is sufficiently large, that even though there is some new production coming on and there's the threat of digital imaging that will reduce silver usage perhaps in the future in photography. But we think that that gap uh, has is wide enough so that it will continue to deplete inventories, bullion inventories, to the point where a new price is needed to establish equilibrium. And because of the byproduct nature, which makes the supply inelastic, and because of the nature of demand, which is relatively inelastic, uh, that we don't think that that price change would necessarily be, be minor. It's interesting because silver has been artificially influenced for a long time. You saw that movie about uh, you know, it was William Jennings Bryan, who was editor of the Omaha World Herald and a congressman from, from Nebraska, and whose brother was governor of Nebraska, uh, who was the big silver man. And they used to talk 16 to 1. Uh, the, the 16 to 1 ratio, I think, goes back to Isaac Newton when he was master of the mint. Charlie will know all about that because he's our Newtonian uh, uh, expert here. Uh, and, uh, but that, that ratio had kind of mystical significance for a while. It didn't really mean anything. Uh, um, and in 1934, the government passed a, an act called the Silver Purchase Act of, surprisingly, 1934, which set an artificially high price for silver at that time, when production and usage was much less. And the, and the government, the U.S. government ended up accumulating two billion ounces of silver. Now, this was at a time when demand was a couple hundred million ounces a year, so you're talking 10 years supply. So there was an artificially high price for a while, by the 19, early 1960s, that became an artificially low price of $1.29. And at that time, I could see the inventories of the, of the U.S. government being depleted, uh, somewhat akin to what inventories are being depleted now. And despite the fact that Lyndon Johnson and the administration said they would not demonetize silver, they did demonetize it, and silver went up substantially. That was the last purchase we had of silver, but I've kept track of the figures ever since. The Hunt brothers caused a great amount of silver to be converted into bullion form, including a lot of silver coins. So they again increased the supply in a very big way by their action in pushing the price way up to the point where people started melting it down. So you had this dislocations in silver over a 60 plus year period, which has caused the price to be affected by these huge inventory 
accumulations and and uh, and reductions. And we think right now that, uh, or we thought last summer when we started buying it, that at the price we bought it, that that was not an equilibrium price, and that uh, sooner or later, and we didn't think it was imminent because we don't wait till things are imminent. Uh, uh, you know, we we were going to buy a lot of silver. We didn't want to buy so much as to really disrupt the market. However, we had no intention of. Uh, of uh, replaying any any hunt scenario, so we wanted to be sure we didn't buy that much silver, but we liked it. Uh, Charlie? Well, I think this whole episode will have about as much impact on Berkshire Hathaway's future as Warren's bridge playing. <laughs> We've got a line of activity where once every 30 or 40 years you can do something employing 2% of assets. This is not a big deal for no. Berkshire. The fact that it keeps Warren amused and uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't and like not it. doing counterproductive things. It makes me feel makes better it, about it makes me feel better about all those pictures that people take over the weekend. They, they, they all use a little bit of silver. At least it shows. <laughs> at least it shows something that teaches an interesting lesson. Think of the discipline it takes to think about something for three or four decades, waiting for a chance to employ 2% of your assets. I'm afraid that's the way we are. <laughs> it means there'll be some dull stretches. Right. Yeah, it's less than a billion dollars in silver. It's $15 billion in Coke. You know, it's... Uh, it's, it's a non-event. It's $5 billion in American Express. I mean, the... the uh, it, it, it is close to a non-event, but if you see it there, uh, at least it know. shows the human personality at work. <laughs> Very peculiar personality, yeah. I might add. Yeah. <laughs> Reinforced by a partner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any silver on you, Charlie? <laughs> we we had a we had a lot of silver at one time, but we don't have it now. <clears throat> the uh, the original decision, my decision, was that the production of silver and the reclamation of silver, I don't remember the numbers exactly now, but they were running perhaps 100 million ounces or thereabouts less uh, uh, than the consumption. And now a lot of consumption has gone down in photography, but that's where the reclamation was too, so that those tended more to balance each other out. Uh, I haven't looked at the figures for the last year or so, but but silver was out of balance. Now, on the other hand, there were enormous quantities of silver above ground, and there were huge quantities of silver that could could possibly be removed from other uses, perhaps uh, you know, in, in jewelry and all kinds of things that could conceivably add to supply, as they did in the early 1980s when the Hunt Brothers thing took place, but. Overall, silver was being produced and reclaimed at a, uh, at a lesser rate than it was being consumed. And added to that was the fact that there are relatively few pure silver mines. Silver, mine, silver is largely produced as a byproduct of, of uh, copper and lead and zinc, and so that it was not easy to bring on added production. So all of that added up to the fact that, that I thought that silver would get tight at some point and as I said I was very I was early in that conclusion and I was early in selling uh, so we have no silver now and we did not make much money on it and you're right that it it doesn't it doesn't earn anything uh, uh, so you sit with it it's not like it's not like sitting with a stock where in most cases uh, earnings are piling up for you 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 have to hope that a you have to hope that a commodity moves in price because it is not producing anything as it sits there looking at you and that's one of the drawbacks of commodities. Charlie? We, we didn't get where we are by owning non-interest bearing commodities. I don't think it's a big issue around here. We actually owned oil at one time too, didn't we? But We didn't make much money out of it. We made a little money. No, you made quite a bit out of oil. Yeah. But yeah. you know, it's a good habit to trumpet your failures and be quiet about your successes. Yeah. Well, we have more to trumpet than we have to be quiet about. <laughs>